Okay, so my colleague Deborah Savage will introduce our first speaker. Deborah Savage, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, kick it into gear. Let's get all all get an act. Yeah. So it's my great privilege to introduce, first of all, our first speaker, Dr. Michael Root. He's ordinary professor emeritus of systematic theology at the Catholic University of America. He's a native of Norfolk, Virginia, and he studied at Dartmouth College and Yale University. He previously taught at several colleges and seminaries and served for 14 years as research professor at the Institute for Ecumenical Research in Strasbourg, France. Dr. Root was on the drafting team for the Catholic Lutheran Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification and for the U.S. Episcopal Lutheran Full Common Agreement called to Common, Com Common Mission. He is a Lutheran or was a Lutheran for much of his career but was received into the Catholic Church in 2010. No applause is necessary. <laughs> but he's, t he's told me that um, He's the only person in history, save one, who served on both sides of the fence. And I think you should know the only other one was someone named Robert Barnes? Barnes. Barnes, who uh, gave it a shot and was burned at the stake by Henry VIII five years later. <laughs> so we welcome you. <laughs> Now, Robert Barnes was, in fact, burned by this, at the stake. Certain risk of ecumenical relations, as you might find, you're on the wrong side of the table. Um, okay. The title of this paper is The Elliptical Ecumenism of Joseph Rotzinger, Its Foci, and Its Relevance. A defining mark of the ecumenical perspective of Joseph Rotzinger, dating back at least to the late 1950s, has been a kind of balance, not just holding together, but rightly weighting different elements. Now, often balance is a euphemism for boring. And ecumenical writings are often mind-numbingly boring. I know, I've written some. <laughs> Extreme statements are usually more provocative, more stimulating of interesting discussion. The carefully balanced is often cautious, safe. In the case of Rotzinger and his ecumenical outlook, however, it is precisely his unremitting insistence on holding together different elements, elements that can pull in different directions, that have made his outlook, actions, and statements controversial. For Ratzinger, the Catholic faith is itself concerned with a kind of balance. Quote, I'm going to quote Ratzinger throughout. All the quotations in this paper are from Ratzinger. I'm not going to always identify where they're coming from. It will just slow things down too much. Quote, this is Ratzinger. Genuine Catholicism is a highly sensitive balance, an attempt to unite aspects of life which seem to contradict one another, and yet which guarantee the completeness of the credo. In ecumenism, the balance Ratzinger has sought to preserve is a balance present in the theology of the Second Vatican Council. Between, on the one hand, a conviction that the division of baptized Christians who together affirm the classical Trinitarian and Christological confession of the church is an anomaly to which we should never simply become resigned. But on the other hand, a commitment to the belief that the church of Jesus Christ subsists in the communion of bishops gathered together with their head, the Bishop of Rome, along with all the ecclesiological corollaries that go with those commitments. That's I think, the, the balance Rotzinger has kept very well, both the fundamental anomaly of Christian division and yet the insistence that the Church of Jesus Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. Rotzinger's ecumenical outlook has been controversial precisely because he's maintained this admittedly tense double affirmation of the Council and has re resisted temptations to undercut one or the other. In this presentation, I will outline what I think is the ecclesiological basis of Ratzinger's ecumenical perspective, describe how he has engaged Catholic-Protestant, Catholic-Orthodox, and Catholic-Anglican relations, and argue briefly that his perspective is precisely 
what needs to be reaffirmed in our present ecumenical setting. Okay, first section, Rossinger's elliptical understanding of ecumenism and the church. I have called Bat Rotzinger's ecumenical perspective balanced, but it can more precisely be described as elliptical. Remember, an ellipse is a sort of oval with two foci that define the ellipse. He sees certain central realities not as circles with a single focal point, but as ellipses with two essential, if unequal, focal points. This perspective is not an accidental side feature of his, of his vision. He explicitly refers to problems that arise when one focus or the other of the ellipse is absorbed into the other and the ellipse collapses into a circle. Rotzinger's outlook is shaped by a complex web of such ellipses, all closely related to one another, but not simply reducible to one insight. Like his mentor Bonaventure, Rotzinger sketches patterns which, while unified and harmonious, are not reducible to a single reality or principle. Rotzinger is, in the best sense of the word, a systematic theologian, but he has never been one to reduce theology to a deduction from some one first principle. Most decisive for Rotzinger's ecumenical attitude is the fundamentally elliptical picture he gives of the nature of the church. Rotzinger's ecclesiology is elaborated in many of his writings, but here I will focus, take my quotations from one short presentation entitled Deus Locutus Es Nobis in Filio, Some Reflections on Subjectivity, Christology, and the Church. This was a presentation Rotzinger made for a 1999 meeting of representatives of the CDF and representatives of the Episcopal Conferences of North America and Oceania. He there argues that Christ's exist, the church's existence depends on a prior revelation of God, a revelation that, quote, has its definitive and final culmination in the person of the incarnate word. This word, Christ, forms the church, quote, the church ultimately is made up of those who believe this, that this word of God is true. She listens to the word and is formed by the word. This receptivity is truly community forming, quote, that the church is the community brought into being in the faithful reception of the single and definitive word of God implies that it will become a community shaped by the common receptivity to that word. The church is thus constituted for the specific, by the specific relation between the formative word and the formed community. This second focus, the formed community, while utterly dependent for its existence on the word, is yet a true focal point of the ellipse. The word forms a genuine human community, a body that can itself truly receive and respond. As Ratzinger puts it, the church is, quote, a truly new subject called into being in the word and in the Holy Spirit. The community is subject as an agent. It does things. Most notably, it confesses the faith. Quote, the I believe of the creed refers not to some private I, but rather to the corporate I of the church. To be the agent of such corporate action, the church must have a certain kind of unity and coherence. This unity itself is given in the gifts that constitute the church. Again, quoting Ratzinger, she, the church, is one in faith, one in the celebration of the sacraments, one in apostolic succession, and one in ecclesial governance, all gifts of God that are community constitutive. To be such a true subject, the church must have a kind of concrete reality. It must subsist in some clearly delineated community in the world. Herein, Rothsinger identifies a key to the logic of Vatican II's famous declaration that, quote, the unique church of Christ, constituted and organized as a society in this world, subsists in the Catholic church, governed by the successor of Peter, 
and the bishops in communion with him. Only such a concrete, socially delineated body can authoritatively proclaim the word that constitutes it, confidently depend upon the sacraments that give it life, and assuredly guide its members to final communion with God. Only such a delineated and subsistent community can preserve the elliptical nature of the church, God and the human community that God calls into being through his word. An adequate ecclesiology always thus has two foci, the prior and ecclesially constitutive word and the responding and acting concrete human subject constituted by that word. One way an ecclesiology can go wrong is to collapse the ellipse into a circle with a single focal point, either an autonomous human community to which the word is no longer prior, or a word that floats free of any concretely embodied responding subject. In either case, the saving mission of the word in the world, the clear and authoritative proclamation of the word, celebration of the sacraments, and guidance of the flock suffers. The elliptical character of the church cannot be abandoned. Now, in addition to this large ellipsis, I would say there are three sub-ellipses, so to speak, that closely relate to this fundamental character of the church and are ecumenically important. First, the church lives in history as both universal church and local or particular church. As Rotzinger puts it, on the one hand there is, quote, the church as a whole, the one church and the one body, the one bride, and on the other, the empirical and concrete realizations and the various individual parts of the church. As truly church, both universal and particular church must be true subjects, capable of decision and action. Again, one focus of this ellipse, the universal church, is ontologically, and in Rotzinger's view, temporally, prior to the other. They are not simply two equal elements to be somehow coordinated. That's one sub-ellipse. Second sub-ellipse, the church as a corporate body is not the only agent of the foundational I believe. The individual Christian also is an active and responsible agent of faith. The faith of the church is a communal faith, but to be appropriated by individuals. Again, the two foci of the ellipse are not equal for Ratzinger. The faith of the church has a kind of priority to the faith of the individual. The faith of the Christian is a participation in the faith of the church. Thus, quote, by its very nature, faith is this believing communion with the whole church. But again, the priority and foundational character of the one focus of the ellipse does not eliminate the reality and agency of the other. The virtue of faith must inhere in the individual, and the individual must confaith, confess the faith of the church as her own. Third sub-ellipsis is in a sense more pragmatic but sometimes forgotten in ecumenical work. The basic ecclesial ellipse of word and responding community laid out earlier is still in the strict sense of the word an ecclesiological ellipse. Is it, a, it is a distinction and interrelation in the theology of the church. It is an ellipse in our understanding. But ecumenism is not simply a matter of the encounter of theologies or of concepts. It is certainly not the encounter of professors, but of concrete communities embedded in particular cultural, ecclesiastical, and political histories. Doctrinal matters are foundational, but ecclesial communion involves actual communities living in fellowship. Realizing a genuinely common life requires that so-called non-doctrinal matters bound up with a common life cannot be simply ignored. Again, two foci here, a rather different kind of a focus. It's the church understood, so to speak, ecclesiologically and sociologically. Uh, they can't be ignored, so to speak, if you're actually going to do ecumenical relations. That's the sort of foundation, a big ellipse, word responding community, three sub-ellipses, universal local, uh, faith of the church, faith of the individual, Church as, as sort of conceptual, ecclesiological reality. Church as concrete, sociological, historically embedded reality. Now, 
turn now second large section of the paper, Ratzinger on Ang Orthodoxy, Protestantism, and Anglicanism. Ratzinger's ecumenical outlook has followed the general path of post-conciliar Catholic ecumenism. It is focused far more on bilateral relations, that is, relations with specific non-Catholic communities, than on multilateral ecumenism, that is, dealing with a bunch of different churches all at once, or with the World Council of Churches. With the exception of his experience in the 1970s as one of the first Catholic full members of the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches, an experience about which Rotzinger's comments are not altogether positive, Rotzinger's ecumenical writings most often address particular specific Catholic relations with Orthodox, Protestant, and Anglicans. He consistently has seen Orthodox and Protestant relations as presenting fundamentally different models, of, excuse me, as presenting fundamentally different questions. Among Christian divisions, quote, there are two basic types to which two different models of unity correspond. The first type is exemplified by the split between Catholic and Orthodox and the split between Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian churches. These divisions share as background, quote, the unity of ecclesial and doctrinal structure that underlies Nicaea. That's one type, sort of Catholic Orthodox. The second type is exemplified by Catholic Protestant relations, where that shared ecclesial background has been lost. Catholic Orthodox and Catholic Protestant ecumenism, thus for Ratzinger, pre represent distinct characters. To use my own language, Catholic Orthodox differences are not over the existence of the elliptical structures I outlined, but over specific aspects of those structures. For Ratzinger, however, Protestantism has lost sight of these elliptical structures and tends to collapse them into circles. The ecclesiological framework shared by Catholic and Orthodox is absent from Catholic Protestant discussions, making ecumenical dialogue and engagement more difficult in the Catholic Protestant than the Catholic Orthodox sphere. Any consideration of Ratzinger's ecumenism must look at the two sorts of relations separately and then bring them together in a comprehensive view. Under closer inspection, similarities in Ratzinger's analysis of Catholic Orthodox and Catholic Protestant differences emerge particularly if one includes Ratzinger's one extended engagement with Anglicanism. I would add that Ratzinger's ecumenical method so to speak, is essentially that of most post-conciliar Catholic ecumenical theology. He is open to a hermeneutic of doctrine, which places the particular language and conceptuality of a particular doctrinal affirmation in a wider kind of historical focus where you might be able better to see commonalities. Rotzinger can hardly be accused of ignoring the claim of truth, but in the ecumenical setting, he adds, quote, whenever then the weight of truth and its incontrovertibility are involved, they must be met by a corresponding sincerity that avoids laying claim to truth prematurely and is ready to search for the inner fullness of truth with the eyes of love. As I will note in a few concrete cases, in practice, when Ratzinger believes that a doctrinal matter is a close call, so to speak, or not of a clearly decisive significance, he opts for unity, not division. He tends, I think, in a close call to see unity rather than division when it's a sort of not clear what's going on. Okay, first, Ratzinger and Protestantism. Ratzinger's interest in certain aspects of Protestant theology emerged quite early in his career. Ratzinger himself notes, that ideas in his 1959 essay, so quite early, on the theology of death, draw on the work of the Lutheran Paul Althaus. And Ratzinger's development of the concept of a dialogical immortality seems to me, in fact, to be a kind of Catholic extension of issues argued among Lutheran theologians in Germany in the interwar years. In the late 1960s, while teaching at Tübingen, Ratzinger took doctoral students on a trip to Basel to meet and talk with Karl Barth. 
In his theology, he formed an interest under the influence of one of his teachers, Gott Gottlieb Zürngen. Ratzinger's picture of Protestantism does tend, I think, to be a tad European, and more specifically German, and thus highly oriented to the 16th century reformers, especially Martin Luther. Now, I think Ratzinger's interpretation of Luther can be seen as overly conditioned by the views of German, mostly Protestant, mid-20th century Luther scholarship. But that is simply to admit that Ratzinger is a man of his age. When Euro while European-oriented, Ratzinger did not lose sight of the increasingly non-European character of Protestantism. And he criticized the Rahner Fries ecumenical proposal, unity of the churches and actual possibility for its narrowly German focus. You'd never know from reading the Rahner Fries book that there are Protestants who aren't basically structured like Germans and think like the German Protestant church. Um, Ratzinger has consistently expressed critical appreciation for Luther for, quote, the greatness of his spiritual fervor. During a visit to Germany in 2011, and thus as Pope, he said, what constantly exercised Luther was the question of God, the deep passion and driving force of his whole life's journey. This fact, quote, never ceases to make a deep impression on me. Ratzinger's appreciation of Luther is rooted in Ratzinger's own deeply Augustinian theological outlook. He shares with Luther an acute consciousness of the manifold ways sin lurks within the self. In addition, because Ratzinger's theological orientation is more to the Bible and the fathers than to the metaphysical schemes of the great scholastics, his theological language is often more open to fruitful interaction with Protestant discourse. Note, for example, the ease with which Ratzinger can use the term faith to refer to the Christian's entire relation to God. You can find this throughout the Jesus books, and you can find it specifically in Space Salvi in some detail. Ratzinger's appreciation for Luther does not exclude, however, a penetrating critique of Luther's theology and especially its significance for the church. Using my categories, I would say that Ratzinger sees Luther, and with him Protestantism, making fundamental theological moves that undercut one of the foci of the ecclesial ellipse that I have described with disastrous results. Ratzinger is aware of the ambiguity that pervaded Luther's writings and has persisted to pervade Lutheranism. On the one hand, Luther affirmed the ancient creeds and emphatically defended the real presence of Christ's body and blood in, in the Eucharist, and the reality of baptismal regeneration in infants. He had some difficulty justifying his belief, but he defended it, I mean, to the whole, to the, to the end. Luther repeatedly and sincerely insisted that his intention was to remain a Catholic Christian, although what he meant by Catholic Christian is shaped by his reading of church history and by his rather odd apocalyptic ecclesiology of the remnant church. On the other hand, however, and more significantly, decisive for Luther's understanding of the Christian and the church was the correlation of the word understood as the pure word of unconditional forgiveness and faith understood as a strictly passive, mere passive, an utterly certain reception of the word of forgiveness. These two elements, the word of pure forgiveness and the passive and certain reception of that word constitute the Christian's justification, and that encounter with the word and faith so described constitute the church. The church as responding subject, as a real, even though in thoroughly dependent agent, does not completely disappear, but its role is, in, is severely undercut. The result, Ratzinger contends, is, quote, the minimizing of what is essentially Christian. The church as a divinely, as divinely instituted becomes limited, Ratzinger contends for Luther, to the congregation gathered around the proclamation of the word of forgiveness. Apostolic unity in communion with the whole church, represented in the communion among the bishops, ceases to be decisive. This diminution of the human element in the ellipse of the constitution of the church then transforms, 
in fact, effectively collapses, the ellipse of communal and individual faith. The touchstone of authentic faith for Luther, the criterion of theological truth, is found only in the certainty found in the encounter of word and personal faith. The role of the church as teacher and sure interpreter of the gospel is drastically altered. As Ratzinger puts it, quote, Luther could no longer share that certainty which recognizes in the church's community consciousness, superior to private reflection and interpretation. Thus, the relationship between the church and the Bible is fundamentally altered. The constitutive interrelation of individual and church in faith is lost. Thus, quote, in Luther's view, faith is no longer, as it is for Catholics, of its essence, a sharing in the faith of the entire church. This conceptual shift in understanding faith has far-reaching effects when embodied in concrete Christian communities. Like any community, Protestant churches have ways of excluding some behaviors and beliefs. Protestant region, regional and national churches in Europe wrote confessions in faith, and in many countries, their authority was backed by the power of the state. Actually, for example, in 18th century Denmark, you had no rights as an adult citizen unless you were confirmed in the Lutheran state church. Uh, that's an established church. Uh, when Kierkegaard talks about an established church, people think it just means he means like a church of England. He didn't mean that. He meant a, church, a, a state where you had to be confirmed to the state church to even be a full citizen. Uh, that's that's your, the power of the state enforcing a certain kind of, of doctrinal norm. However, such statements of faith no longer embody formal doctrinal authority. They can be at most human and thus fallible summaries of the faith. The ability of Protestant bodies to teach with authority inevitably tends to buckle under pressure, especially after the sponsorship of the state disappears. The Catholic elements that remain in such churches thus tend to lose their capacity to transform church life. They become matters of taste for this or that congregation or parish. You might like sort of smells and bells liturgy, so you go to the high church Lutheran church down the street. Rotziger's interpretation of Luther was vigorously criticized by the Catholic Luther scholar, Peter Mons of Mainz, who emphasized the importance of more Catholic elements in Luther's thought. Mons is, I believe, to a significant degree, correct in some of his criticisms of Ratzinger's reading of Luther. That is, that his reading is to a degree simplifying and privileging the more radical or Protestant side of Luther. But Ratzinger can and did reply that some prominent Protestant interpretations of Luther, particularly Eilert Hams and Heiko Obermann, read Luther in the same way he did. Uh, what often isn't seen is that the sort of reading of Luther that Ratzinger liked, Paul Hawker's book on, on the I and Luther, is in an odd way a kind of funhouse mirror image of a radical Protestant interpretation. It's just that what the Protestants celebrate as a revelatory breakthrough of the true gospel, Hawker sees as a destruction of the true church. So what you had was a kind of middle ground, a sort of high church Lutherans and sort of Catholics who read Luther in a more Catholic way who occupied the middle, and then you had the sort of on the, on the sort of more conservative Catholics and more radical Protestants who agreed what Luther was about, but just either thought it was really wonderful or absolutely horrible. Um, <laughs> this is where Rothsinger, in an odd way, I would say, is still captive to a degree to a certain reading of Luther from Gerhard Abeling, the more radical reading of Luther put forward by German Protestants that a certain kind of Catholic echoed in a sort of reverse way. But that's, that's beside the point. Even if Rot, you know, this, uh, here's the beside the point. Even if Rotzinger's Lutheran interpreta Luther interpretation needs qualification and nuance, Rotzinger's analysis of the concrete ecclesial consequences of Luther's shift on the nature of faith appear borne out by the facts of Protestant life. Rotzinger pointed out these consequences in his contribution to the debate in the late 1970s over a possible Catholic recognition of the Luther and Augsburg Confession on its 450th anniversary in 1980. Ratzinger is typically appreciative of Catholic elements present in the Augsburg Confession. When Lutheranism has oriented itself to the Augsburg Confession, he says, quote, it has come very close structurally to the Catholic model. But the ambiguity present in Luther himself is reflected in the Lutheran Confessions. In the Book of Concord, 
the official collection of Lutheran confessions, which includes other far less Catholic texts, the apology to the, to the Augsburg Confession by Philip Melanchthon and the small call articles by Luther himself. In addition, Luther's writings, while not officially normative in the Lutheran churches, nevertheless have a normative, informally normative status in much Lutheran theology, often outweighing the confessions. Rotzinger presses the question, just what is the normative status of ecclesial statements of faith in contemporary Protestantism? Would a Catholic recognition of the Catholic nature of the Augsburg Confession, which was being discussed in the late 1970s, give that confession a status as normative teaching that in fact it doesn't in practice actually have in the Lutheran churches. Thus he says, a Catholic recognition of the Augsburg Confession presupposes an evangelical recognition. That is a recognition that here the church teaches and can teach as church. Here one sees the acute fashion in which Rotzinger combines an attention to theological principles with an appreciation for the ecclesiastical realities that cannot be ignored in concrete ecumenical relations. A similar set of sensitivities is evident in Rotzinger's involvement with the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification of 1999. The drafting and ratification of the Joint Declaration took place during the, his time as prefect of the CDF and the division of labor between that dicastery and the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity meant that Rotzinger was not directly involved in most of the process. The CDF did, in fact, cooperate in smoothing the path for the Joint Declaration by appointing a representative, a close friend of Rotzinger's, uh, Professor Becker of the Gregorian, to a representative of the CDF to participate in the last two drafting sessions to sort of warn the drafting committee of what would and wouldn't fly uh, with the CDF. Section six of the clarification section of the Vatican's 1998 initial official response to the joint declaration, in fact, sets out just the questions about the nature of ecclesial authority in Protestantism that Rotzinger had raised. However, as is well known, when the ratification process of the Joint Declaration seemed to have reached an impasse in late 1998, Rotzinger intervened in a less than fully official capacity to ensure that the ratification would occur. If it were not for Rotzinger's intervention at the last minute, the whole process would have run aground. Now, after the ratification, Rotzinger wrote an analysis of the Joint Declaration and what it did and did not accomplish, an analysis that I think exemplifies his ecumenical outlook. He begins by locating the discussion of the particular ecclesial, excuse me, he begins by locating the discussion in the particular ecclesial cultural situation of the present. The Augustinian framework shared by everyone in the 16th century with its focused sense of sin and the need for forgiveness has faded today, even for many devout Catholics and Lutherans. Our outlook, the context in which we understand the issues and what is at stake in them is not that of the reformers or of the prelates of the Council of Trent. Any evaluation of the ecumenical significance of the commonalities and differences needs to take this changed context into account. Against this background, Rossinger analyzes specific doctrinal issues addressed in the Joint Declaration and finds enough agreement to justify the Joint Declaration's conclusions. Let me note, however, his comment on one specific issue, the simul justus et peccator, that the justified Christian is both sinful and justified simultaneously. In relation to, quote, his term, the extremely subtle discussions on the question of the simul justus et peccator, his comment is particularly interesting. Quote, I furthermore simply cannot believe that the division of the church and the question of the nature of the true faith, a faith which after all was intended for simple people, should depend on so much subtle argument. When I first read that comment, at the time it was published in 2002, I was rather taken aback. Now this is when I was a Lutheran. The three paragraphs in the joint declaration on the simuliosis at Picador were some of the most difficult to draft in the entire document. The Lutheran paragraph on the Similiosis Epicator in that document is the longest paragraph in the entire text. 
because it took the Lutherans so long to agree on what we believed. Um, when I, the topic had been the focus of a worry in the original official response of the Catholic Church. And yet here is Rotzinger, the prefect of the CDF, who seems rather blasé in his attitude to the issue. I think this comment reveals two aspects of his ecumenical attitude. First, here we see that Rotzinger places the burden of proof on division, not unity. As noted, when an issue is a close call or not clearly of decisive significance for ecclesial communion, Rotzinger tends to opt for unity. But second, he here follows through in his conviction about where the root of Catholic Protestant division lies in the collapse of the ecclesial ellipse I described, the loss of a true ecclesial subject who responds to God and is the agent of teaching and the sacraments. Division is not, for Rotzinger, rooted in subtleties of the doctrine of justification. Here, in fact, he's in line with one line of Catholic criticism of Lutheranism going back at least to the Leipzig Disputation of 1519. Rotzinger's engagement with Protestant theology and the Protestant churches has been thus carefully enunciated and balanced. Critics often miss, I think, the affirmative side of his attitude. After the release by the CDF of the text Communionis Notio in 1992, an exchange of letters occurred between Rotzinger and the Lutheran Bishop of Bavaria, Johannes Hanselmann. Hanselmann was in particular concerned with the reaffirmation in Communionis Notio that ecclesial communities that have not preserved apostolic succession lack a valid Eucharist. Rotzinger's response does not retreat from the Catholic teaching. He insists the Catholic Church cannot hold that an evangelical Eucharist is valid. However, he notes that, quote, the question of the Eucharist cannot be reduced to the problem of validity. Catholic theology, he says, quote, should in no way deny the saving presence of the Lord, heil schaffende Gegenwart des Herrn, in the evangelical Lord's Supper. I had a colleague, Luther, oh, if we have the salvation-granting presence of the Lord, what more do we need? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like an enormously large concession, but he never backed down on the question that it's not valid. It's not a valid Eucharist. The comments surprise many, especially Protestants, but it is in keeping with Rotzinger's total outlook. The question of a valid ministry in Eucharist is ecclesially central for Rotzinger, but it never blinded him to what can and should be affirmed. Second, Rotzinger and orthodoxy. This will be a good deal shorter. Rotzinger's theological engagement with Catholic orthodox relations has in some ways been less theologically sharp-edged than his engagement with Protestantism. With the orthodox, he has repeatedly stated that he does not think the differences are theologically, quote, insoluble. Unity is, from a theological perspective, quote, fundamentally possible. Catholics and Orthodox, as I noted, have shared the classical ecclesial framework that the Reformation rejected. The ellipse Rotzinger finds collapsed by the Protestants is affirmed by the Orthodox. The disagreement is over the precise constitution of the communal human subject that forms one focus of the ellipse, namely over the role of the papal primacy in the constitution and life of that subject. Thus, Catholic Orthodox discussions start from a different location than Catholic Protestant discussions. This shared background makes possible Rotzinger's well-known 1974 contention that, quote, Rome must not require more from the East with respect to the doctrine of primacy than had been formulated and was lived in the first millennium. Now, as Rotzinger later noted, his comment on Anglicanism, that contention presumed that the shared faith of the first millennium contains nothing that contradicts the further developments that took place in the Catholic Church, a presumption that, of course, not all Orthodox would actually share. This later statement of Rotzinger's was already implicit, I would say, in the 1974 essay, when he added that the nothing more should be required, he added to that the statement that the East would need to cease, quote, to cease to oppose as heretical the developments that took place in the West and the second millennium. Now, ecumenism is not simply about doctrine, however, but about concrete, historically embodied communities. And here, Rotzinger recognizes the difficulties 
that stand in the way of Catholic Orthodox rapprochement. A history of alienation and suspicion must be overcome. Even as he affirmed the theological possibility of Catholic Orthodox unity, he noted the need for its, quote, spiritual preparation. In light of, quote, the historical and institutional burdens to be faced, he has said that, quote, one must be very cautious with concrete hopes. Rotzinger's openness to theological agreement with the East did not blind him, however, to the importance of the focused but real difference that exists between them on papal primacy. The question of primacy touches one of those sub-ellipses I earlier mentioned, the ellipse of the universal church and the local or particular church. Rotziger notes that the Orthodox make a claim about themselves parallel to the Catholic claim. They say the Orthodox similarly understand themselves as the community in which the Church of Christ subsists. Rotzinger has expressed the concern, however, that without some form of primacy, even the Catholic Church, quote, would have long ago fallen apart into national churches or churches of this or that right. If that occurs, the existence of the one church as a genuine subject of agency is endangered. He sees that danger in the way autocephaly has developed in modern orthodoxy. Rotzinger, in fact, cites someone from within orthodoxy, the theologian and historian John Meyendorf, an essay of Meyendorf's on churchly regionalism that developed within orthodoxy in the wake of the end of the Byzantine Empire. Thus, though Ratzinger does not see the theological issue at stake in Catholic Orthodox relations as of the same magnitude as that of at stake in Catholic Protestant relations, one should not conclude that he sees in that issue something trivial or insignificant. It touches on an essential matter, the constitution of the universal church as an agent capable of action. Finally, in this section, Ratzinger on Anglicanism. Ratzinger's one extended discussion of Catholic-Anglican relations indicates how one can group together his perspectives on Protestantism and Orthodoxy. Commenting on the CDF's significantly critical assessment of the 1982 final report of the International Roman Catholic, Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, Ratzinger tended to interpret the problems involved in Catholic-Anglican relations in a way similar to those he critiqued in Anglican and Catholic Protestant relations. Ratzinger saw the decisive issue in Catholic Anglican relations as parallel. Quote, the issue is, quote, the value of dogma as opposed to private judgment. Now that's a rather Protestant reading of Anglicanism. The issue there is private judgment. However, when you read his entire essay, a lot of his analysis bears on the relation of the universal church to the particular church, the inability of the Anglican communion as a whole to hang together, and the capacity of the universal church to make a binding decision which a particular church cannot call into question. The proposal on authority of Archic was that when a decision of a council or a pope is not manifestly biblical, a regional church could, so to speak, hold it up for consideration. That's what he's rejecting. But note, that's a kind of universal local church issue. It's not so much a simple issue about private judgment, although they're parallel in some ways. That is, much of his discussion of Catholic-Anglican relations is more similar to his discussion of Catholic Orthodox relations than his discussion of Catholic Protestant relations. Thus, in Rotzinger's ecumenical outlook, Anglicans do constitute a particular kind of bridge. Here's a bridge between Orthodox mistakes and Protestant mistakes. They're sort of lost in between their own unique kind of hybrid mistake. Um, it's a rather different kind of Anglican bridge church. I hope I insulted any Anglicans here. Uh, which, uh, the Anglican bridge church, which allows us to locate more precisely a central concern in Rotzinger's total ecumenical engagement, a concern with a concrete community which forms the human focus of the ecclesial ellipse. The ontologically fundamental form of the human focus is the universal church as a subsistent historical reality, a delineated social body. The issue with the orthodox is a more focused difference on the internal constitution of that body. With Anglicans, it is the more general question of the authority of the universal in relation to the particular church. With Protestantism, or in particularly Luther, the issue is the authentic embodiment of that human focus in history. Thus, there is a kind of continuum, but there's a constant issue here, and it's the nature of that human fo focus 
of the fundamental ecclesial ellipse, that he sees endangered in different ways, somewhat by the Orthodox, more by the Anglicans, even more by a certain kind of radical reading of Luther. Last section of the paper. Rotzinger in the present ecumenical situation. Rotzinger's career as theologian and churchman spanned the explosion of Catholic ecumenical engagement in the conciliar and post-conciliar periods. Does he still have something to say about Catholic ecumenism as we approach the end of the first quarter of the 21st century? Rotzinger's outlook is, I believe, particularly relevant for the foreseeable future. Rotzinger, perhaps especially because of the balance of his ecumenical perception, his recognition of the multiple elements involved in ecumenical relations, always saw the magnitude of the difficulties involved in true ecclesial reconciliation. In the last set of interviews with Peter Zewald, he was asked what had disappointed him most in, quote, the ecumenical process. He replied, I have been difficult to disappoint there because I am simply familiar with the reality and know what one may and may not expect concretely. 20 years before that, he had said, we had in fact overrated our own capacities if we believed that theological dialogues could, within a fairly brief time, restore the unity of belief. Now, some would complain that such an allegedly realistic ecumenical attitude easily becomes a self-fulfilling negative prophecy, and the worry should not be immediately dismissed. I believe, though, that for today and for a long time to come, we need precisely Rotzinger's commitment to facing reality rather than escaping into what he calls unity utopias, Einheitsutopian. I have argued elsewhere that the concept ecumenical winter, which has been in the air for 35 years, is problematic because it is too optimistic. <laughs> I mean that. Winter is followed inevitably by spring. But the idea that somehow we just wait out this ice age and there will be a new spring is, I think, fundamentally false. Winter excuse me, an analysis of the nature of long-term change in various settings and of the patterns of interchurch relations in history, I believe indicates that the change tends to come in intense, limited periods of realignment, followed by long periods of what biologists call coordinated stasis, where all the different species in a particular area, there may be some variation, but they tend not to change for centuries, millennia, uh, until something happens, shakes it all up, and they settle down into a fairly stable pattern. That tends to be the way long-term change occurs. Think of division in the church. It tends to occur in sudden bursts. The arguments over the now Chalcedonian Chalcedonians, East and West, Protestant in the 16th century, then everything settles down. You have the confessionalization, as it's called, of the late 16th century. An age of significant change in our attitudes and actions in relation to Christian division but with strikingly little change in the institutional structures of division, has now, I believe, settled down into stable patterns resistant to disruption. This is more so, I think, in Catholic Protestant than Catholic Orthodox relations, where the difficulties in Catholic Orthodox relations seem to be much more tied up with vol perhaps volatile political realities. The time calls not for a revolutionary ecumenism with its addiction to breakthroughs and what can be presented as progress. But for a normal ecumenism, I would say, it finds ways to recognize we do in fact, recognize the unity we do in fact possess, learn from one another across confessional boundaries, act together in witness and service when we can, and challenge one another in ways that can further the faithfulness to Christ, which is the foundation of all true ecumenism. The twin temptations in our situation are on the one hand, rushing ahead into theologically and ecclesially unjustified actions, and on the other, settling down comfortably in our separated ecclesial camps. Rossinger consistently warned against ecumenical proposals that are not based in true unity in faith, and thus will not prompt produce true unity in Christian life. Quote, history shows that a superficial unity based on omissions, omissions, auf auslassen begründete, without inward preparation through actual living, could prove harmful. The particular temptation on this side today, to be pointed, comes from proposals for various forms of intercommunion that have arisen particularly from some recent Catholic Lutheran discussions. Despite the language of being on the way, experience of some intra-Protestant full communion agreements along similar lines show that the result is not a lived unity, 
but a comfortable indifference that falls into the patterns of the consumer market. Catholic and Protestant will just become Coke and Pepsi, <laughs> which is the way I think many people perceive it anyway. As Wat Ratzinger warned, such proposals, quote, by pressing on thoughtlessly, destroy the living thing we cannot create, but only cherish. The opposite temptation, however, is perhaps less pressing, but more subtle. The temptation to live and think entirely within our own ecclesial enclosure, simply ignoring Christians outside our own church body, or at most, treating them as potential converts. It is natural for each tradition to have a special concern for its own history and life. Catholic self-understanding excuse me, Catholic self-understanding in relation to the gifts given to the Catholic Church might particularly encourage an engagement with a specifically Catholic tradition. The Catholic Church sorely needs, I believe, a wider resource mall that reappropriates aspects of its theological and liturgical life that have been ignored, often actively, intentionally, and vigorously ignored over the last 60 years. That theological renewal, however, must include a renewed ecumenical engagement, more sober and modest perhaps, but essential if we are to rightly grasp what the Catholic Church is and is not. Ratzinger himself calls for a different theological approach. Quote, theological dialogues should be carried out in a much more relaxed way, less oriented towards success, in a more humble way, with more serenity and patience. Now, I opened this presentation with the statement that Rossinger's ecumenical outlook was controversial because it was balanced. It was controversial because he held to the ecclesiology of Vatican II. But, or better for that reason, he also refused to ignore the anomaly of Christian division. He thus felt compelled on occasion to repeat the sometimes painful truth of that anomaly. An example that I will close with is an exchange that took place at the beginning of this century. In 2001, Ratzinger responded at length to a letter from an old friend of his, Damaskinos Papandreou, who at that time was the Orthodox Metropolitan of Switzerland and the Ecumenical Patriarch's point man for ecumenism in the West. He had pressed on Ratzinger what he saw as a contradiction between Ratzinger's ecumenically positive remarks as a professor and various statements of the CDF under Ratzinger's leadership, especially Dominus Jesus. After a lengthy discussion, Ratzinger concludes with these words, and with these words, I'll close my presentation. To us, it is not given to resolve the paradox of the faithfulness of God and the faithlessness of men. Quote, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13. Our task is rather to suffer that contradiction and thus contribute in our own measure to a resolution. This is ultimately a problem of life itself. It's a problem of existence, not of concepts. I understand Dominus Jesus as intending to transform the indifference with which all churches are regarded as different but equally valid so that the validity of faith disappears in skepticism. Change it once more into a lively suffering, ein waches Leiden, and thus to kindle anew the true fervor of ecumenism. Thank you. so many questions. Okay, so I, it's really my honor to introduce Dr. Christian Washburn. I should have revealed in the interest of full disclosure that we worked together for 13 years at the St. Paul Seminary. So I know a lot more about him than I should. So I'm just going to proceed to his um, bio. I was supposed to be a little joke, but it was the best I could do. <laughs> uh, so he's professor of dogmatic theology at the University of St. Thomas. The St. Paul Seminary is a college within the university. He completed his PhD in church history at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. His articles, which are numerous, have appeared in journals such as uh, Honorarium Historiae Conciliarum, The Thomist, Pro Ecclesia, Nova et Vetera, and Gregorianum. He has served on the National Catholic Reform Dialogue the National Catholic Evangelical Dialogue, the National Catholic Lutheran Dialogue, and the International Lutheran 
Roman Catholic Commission on Unity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Christian Washburn. Thank you. Uh, my uh, talk today is uh, Joseph Ratzinger, the theologian, Lumen Gentium 8, subsisted in, and ecumenism. Dr. Root has correctly pointed out the defining mark of Ratzinger's contribution to ecumenism is his ability to rightly weigh different elements that tend to pull apart in different directions. I would argue that Ratzinger's interpretation of subsisted in holds two, uh, two elements that pull in different directions. One, the Church of Christ is exclusively identified with the Catholic Church. Two, there is a real ecclesiality outside of this one church. I consider this to be Joseph Ratzinger's most important contribution to ecumenism. That is his repeated uh, clarification of the meaning of Lumen Gentium 8's famous subsisted in clause. For both the nature and extent of the church and the proximate and remote goals of ecumenism depend on the correct interpretation of this phrase. Ratzinger's views as pre prefect of the CDF on subsisted in are well known. Less well known are his uh, views as a theologian. And these have led some theologians to allege that Ratzinger, uh, the prefect of the CDF, contradicts Ratzinger, the theologian, on subsisted in. In this talk, I will examine Ratzinger, uh, the theologian's understanding of subsisted in, from, the time as a, from his time as a young theologian at the Second Vatican Council until his appointment as prefect of the CDF in 1981. To this end, I will briefly outline the history of Lumen Gentium VIII, I will then briefly examine the five different ways that theologians have conceived of the relationship of the Church of Christ to the Catholic Church and to non-Catholic churches and ecclesial communities based on the change from S to subsisted in. I will then examine Ratzinger's views during the council, then Ratzinger's thought in the post-conciliar period until his appointment as prefect of the CDF. Finally, I will offer a short uh, reflection on some of the ecumenical implications of Ratzinger's position. Lumen Gentium and subsisted in. As is well known, the teaching of the magisterium on the eve of the Second Vatican Council was that there was an exclusive identity between the Church of Christ and the Catholic Church. This was the teaching of the great 16th century doctors of the church, Saints Robert Bellarmine, Francis de Sale, and Lawrence of Brindisi. All three doctors also affirmed the presence of elementa in non-Catholic churches and communities. In Missigi Corpus Christi, Venerable Pius XII reasserted this exclusive identity using est. This true church of Christ is the holy Catholic apostolic Roman church. The doctrine was not well received in some quarters, and Pius XII in his encyclical Humani Generis felt it necessary to rebuke Catholic theologians for not assenting to church teaching. Quote, some say they are not bound by the doctrine explained in our uh, encyclical letter of a few years ago. And based on the uh, sources of revelation, which teaches that the mystical body of Christ and the Roman Catholic Church are one and the same thing. Pius XII's two texts will eventually be cited in footnote 10 of the final draft of Lumen Gentium's Article 8. The drafting of what would become Lumen Gentium went through four main schemata. The initial schema was drafted from 1960 to 1962. On November 23, 1962, the first schema was distributed to the Council Fathers in the 25th General Congregation. This initial schema maintained Pius XII's traditional est formula. Here, this est sat together with the claim that there were elementa outside of the Catholic Church. This is an important point, since some dissenting theologians often argue that the introduction of subsisted in formula was because est and elementa were considered fundamentally incompatible with each other. On December 1st, 1962, debate on the schema began in the 31st General Congregation, lasting six general congregations. The first schema, however, was not well received, and the Council Fathers criticized it for being too legalistic, too scholastic, and not sufficiently pastoral. The draft was sent back to the De Ecclesia subcommission of the Doctrinal Commission for Redrafting, 
On September 30, 1963, a second draft was distributed to the Council Fathers. And debate on the second schema began in the 37th General Congregation, continuing to the 59th General Con Congregation of October 31, 1963. This draft also repeats the S formula of the first schema, and again affirmed uh, that elementa are present in other non-Catholic ecclesial communities. The second schema, too, was found wanting for a variety of reasons. The redrafting of the document was again entrusted to the De Ecclesia subcommission of the Doctrinal Commission. It was during the second redrafting that the phrase subsisted in replaced the est of the first and second schemata. The text now read that the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. The text was presented to the Fathers on September 15, 1964. The Relatio took up the issue of the change from est to subsist in, explaining the change this way. In place of is, subsisted in is used, that the expression may be, better, may be in better agreement with the affirmation about ecclesial elements which are present elsewhere. No further explanation was given, and the precise origin of the phrase remained unknown until decades after the Council. On November 21, 1964, in the ninth session of the Council, the final vote was taken, and the draft was approved by a vote of 2,151 to 5. Consequently, Paul VI ordered it promulgated. It must be noted that the decree on Oriental churches was promulgated on the same day as Lumen Gentium, and it uses the Est formula. Quote, the Holy Catholic Church is the mystical body of Christ. Theologians uh, ascri have ascribed at least five different ways of conceiving the relationship of the Church of Christ to the Catholic Church and to non-Catholic churches and ecclesial communities based on this change from S to subsisted in. It's important to understand this so that we can better understand Ratzinger's position. The first two ways both entail an exclusive identity. In the first way, the Church of Christ is exclusively and totally identified with the Catholic Church. In this position, there is no ecclesiality in non-Catholic churches and communities. Those outside the Catholic Church are simply not Christians and must be baptized. Versions of this view were held by Tertullian, St. Cyprian, and some Donatists. Although some contemporary theologians inaccurately describe the pre-conciliar position in this fashion. In the second ter interpretation, the Church of Christ is concretely, fully, exclusively identified with the Catholic Church. But there are elementa outside of her which confer a true ecclesiality on non-Catholic churches and communities. The use of the term concrete signifies that the church currently exists here and now. Full signifies that the church has all the attributes given to it by Christ, exclusive that no other communion but the Catholic church is the church of Christ. This is the view ascribed by the CDF to Lumen Gentium after the council. The remaining three ways of understanding the Council's position all entail both a hermeneutic of discontinuity and a rejection of exclusive identity. These are listed in the order to which they move away from the traditional doctrine. In the third way, the Church of Christ is made up of the various Christian denominations as the one subsisting church. In the fourth way, the Church of Christ is made up of multiple subsisting communions. In the fifth and final way, the Church of Christ does not currently fully exist. It only exists on earth in a partially realized state and will not be realized fully until some future time or in the eschaton. Again, it is important to keep these five interpretations in mind as we examine Ratzinger's development on the issue. Joseph Ratzinger and subsisted in during the Second Vatican Council. We now turn to Ratzinger's activity during the Council. On February 25, 1961, while Ratzinger was a young professor at Bonn, he gave a speech on the theology of the Councils in Bensburg. Here, he both challenged Hans Kung's theology of ecumenical councils and addressed the direction which he thought the Second Vatican Council should take. Cardinal Joseph Frings of Cologne was sitting in the front row. 
and was impressed by Ratzinger's speech. Cardinal Frings, who was then president of the German bishops, asked Ratzinger if he would be willing to ghostwrite a speech on the coming council that the cardinal was to deliver later in Genoa. Ratzinger did so, and the cardinal's speech was a success. Pope John XXIII summoned Springs, telling him that Frings' speech expressed his hopes and aspirations for the coming council. Frings admitted that he had not written it, and the pope graciously replied that he had not written his last encyclical either. <laughs> he assured Frings that it was important to have the right advisors, and indeed, Frings picked the correct one. It appears that the pope even borrowed elements of Ratzinger's text for his own uh, opening speech at the council. Cardinal Frings was appointed a member of the Central Preparatory Commission for the Council and began to send to Ratzinger the preliminary schemata for comment, including the schema de ecclesia. Ratzinger attended the Council in all four periods. In the first period, Ratzinger attended the Council as Cardinal Frings' personal peritus. For the remaining three periods, Frings had Ratzinger appointed as a conciliar peritus. And in this capacity, Ratzinger found himself participating on several important commissions. For our purposes, the most important was the doctrinal commission, which was tasked with helping to redraft the first schema of De Ecclesia in light of the father's comments. It is as a consultor to this commission that Ratzinger will be present when subsisted in was first introduced into the schema. There are, in fact, two competing accounts involving Ratzinger and the origin of the phrase subsisted in. The first account involves uh, the vicar of St. Michael's Evangelical Brotherhood in Bremen Horn, Wilhelm Schmidt. Cardinal Gustin Bea invited Schmidt to attend the council during the third and fourth periods as a Protestant observer. Schmidt claims that he gave the formula subsisted in written on a piece of paper to Joseph Ratzinger who passed it along to Cardinal Frings, who saw to it that it was inserted into Lumen Gentium. In a slightly different account, Ratzinger gave the phrase to Sebastian Tromp, who had it inserted into the schema. Of course, the account is intended to show that subsisted in, coming from a Protestant pastor, should not be read in terms of exclusive identity. The basic problem, however, with Schmidt's account is that subsisted in was introduced into the schema in 1963, during the second period of the council, before Schmidt had even attended the council. So even if Schmidt had handed a piece of paper with the phrase to Ratzinger, it does not explain the origin of the term in Lumen Gentium. The second account also involves Ratzinger. On the afternoon of Tuesday, November 26, 1963, the doctrinal commission with 16 fathers and 32 Pariti present met to discuss a schema of Lumen Gentium reworked by Subcommission 1. In this proposed schema, the est had been changed to ad est. When this change came up for discussion, Herbert Schauf immediately opposed this modification since he felt it was not strong enough to express the identity of the Church of Christ with the Catholic Church. Schauf suggested that the term be changed back to est, at which point Trump suggested the phrase subsisted in. Fortunately, a tape recording of the meeting was discovered uh, decades after the council when one can hear Trump explain the meaning of the change. Quote, we can say therefore that the sole church of Christ subsists in the Catholic church. And this is the exclusive right insofar as said that outside of the church, there are nothing but elements. What is clear from this is that Trump subsisted in was intended to replace both ad est and est, but in two different ways. Subsisted in was essentially a rejection of ad est in, but also a clarification of est. Present in this room were amongst others, Cardinals Ottaviani and Michael Brown, as well as Monsignor Joseph Fenton and Father Joseph Ratzinger. Monsignor Phillips asked whether the commission wanted to substitute subsisted in for ad est in. The commission agreed, 
and it was adopted without any further discussion. And this account, subsisted in, is to be read in favor of exclusive identity, i.e. position number two. Ratzinger returned to the topic of exclusive identity, identity shortly after the close of the second period of the council. In response to the Lutheran theologian, Edmund Schlink, the official representative of the Evangelical Church in Germany, the AK Day, uh, to the Second Vatican Council. Schlink had given a series of comments in the, in the press in Rome on October 23, 1963, commenting in part on the second draft of the schema on the church. He objected that if the Catholic Church identifies herself exclusively with the one Church of Christ, it seems that, the, that Catholic ecumenism must see as its end the absorption of Protestant communities into the Catholic Church. Schlink instead proposed a different ecclesiology in which there is a multiplicity of churches in the one Church of Christ. By the term church, Schlink, of course, meant denominations, not local churches. For Schlink, the point of the ecumenical movement was to bring into one community the various existing denominations so that the Lutheran Church, the Reformed Church, the Anglican Church, etc., would become the one church, i.e. position three. But according to him, no currently existing church was yet the concrete church of Christ, position number five. After the end of the second period of the council, Ratzinger published a short booklet in German entitled The Council on the Way, a review of the second session, responding in part to Schlink's comments. While Ratzinger does not directly deal, uh, treat uh, of subsisted in as such, he does discuss the issue of exclusive identity. It is important to recall that at this point, the phrase had already been, been inserted into the third schema in Ratzinger's presence. Ratzinger rejects Schlink's ecclesiology, since it implied that not one of the existing churches is the Church of Christ. Ratzinger notes that, quote, a Catholic cannot share this view. Ratzinger explains, quote, ever since the days of primitive Catholicism, which reaches back to the time of the New Testament, it has been considered essential to believe that the Church really exists. To that extent, Professor Schlink's contention that there exists an identification of the Catholic Church with the Church of Christ is valid. Here, Ratzinger reaffirms position two, i.e. exclusive identity. For Ratzinger, the identification of the Church of Christ with the Catholic Church then goes back to the foundation of the Church itself. Ratzinger, Ratzinger agrees with Schlink that the Church of Christ is made up of a plurality of churches but in a very different sense from Schlink. What Ratzinger means is that the universal church is made up of a plurality of local churches, not a plurality of denominations. For Ratzinger, there are, bas there are basically two essential conditions for a body of Christians to be a church. First, a body of Christians must be assembled by its bishop at the table of the Lord. Or to put it another way, it is to have two elementa, a bishop and the Eucharist. Second, a body of Christians must be in communion with other local churches. For Ratzinger, this plurality of local churches, quote, exists within the framework of the one invisible church of God, each of which represents the totality of the church. Ratzinger notes the New Testament understanding of the church of Christ only recognizes a plurality of local churches and has no notion of, quote, separated uh, denominational communities making up the church. Ratzinger goes on to note that the Orthodox churches are fundamentally different from those communities that emerged from the Reformation. In the Orthodox local churches, quote, everything the church considered necessary for a church remained, unquote. So for Ratzinger, the Orthodox have true local churches because they have preserved the essential ecclesial structures proper to a local church. Protestant communities, on the other hand, had not preserved the episcop episcopacy and therefore could not even be considered local churches. 
So for Ratzinger, neither the Orthodox churches nor the Protestant churches are the church or part of it. But the various individual Orthodox communities surrounding a bishop are each a true local church. Returning to Schlink's objection that ecumenism appears for the Catholic Church to be a form of absorption, Ratzinger notes that in the modern period, an anomaly arose in which the local church of Rome has begun to absorb other local churches through a process of centralization. As a result, uniformity in the church began to replace authentic Catholic unity. Ratzinger thinks that when uniformity is confused with unity, it's natural for Catholics and non-Catholics to think that absorption is the goal of Catholic ecumenism. Vatican II, according to Ratzinger, was attempting to correct this problem so that the New Testament balance between a true notion of a plurality of local churches and the one, ch and the one church can be reestablished. He makes two suggestions. First, Catholics have to be ready to accept a plurality of local churches. He holds, quote, the Catholic Church has no right to absorb churches, unquote. The goal of eucunism is in part that these other non-Catholic churches and communities to take their place within the church, i.e. the Catholic church. He thinks that when they enter the Catholic church, they must remain in existence as churches making, quote, only those modifications which such a uni unity necessarily requires, unquote. Ratzinger concludes with two salient observations. A, it is true that the Catholic Church can, cannot simply adopt Professor Schlink's view based on the idea that all existing churches have practically equal rights. This is tantamount to asking the Catholic Church, uh, tantamount to asking that the Catholic Church convert to Protestantism, since this view corresponds to the Protestant concept of the church. This makes as little sense as the opposite. Although the Catholic, B, Although the Catholic Church considers itself as the Church of Christ, it nevertheless recognizes its historical deficiency. It recognizes the fact that the plurality of churches, which should exist within it, exist outside of it, and perhaps could only exist outside. Notice again that Ratzinger has reaffirmed exclusive identity and that a true ecclesiality is present outside of the church, i.e. position two. He also explicitly again rejects position three. Ratzinger the theologian after the council. On February 23rd, 1966, about a month and a half after the close of the council, Ratzinger delivered a lecture at a meeting of the Lutheran World Federation's uh, Strasbourg Institute for Ecumenical Research in Alsace. And as a side note, if you ever get a chance to visit this, I visited it in 2018, you should attend. And its former director, Theo Dieter, uh, won the Ratzinger uh, Prize in 2017. In any case, uh, for his work on the JDDJ, by the way. In this, in this lecture, Ratzinger takes up various ecumenical issues that he thinks will have to be investigated anew in light of the council. His themes here are essentially the same as those of his review of the second period. Here for the first time, however, Ratzinger has an explicit discussion of the change from S to subsisted in. He claims that the council's use of subsisted in was necessitated by two facts. First, the council intended to renounce an unconditional identification or a total identification between the Catholic Church and the body of Christ. Second, the council acknowledged that there was a plurality of local churches also out uh, of the one true church. Ratzinger says that the council used subsisted in precisely because it was quote unquote more spacious than est. It is these two points that have led uh, theologians like Francis Sullivan to suggest that Ratzinger, the prefect of the CDF, contradicts Ratzinger, the theologian, on the issue of subsisted in. It is clear, however, that Sullivan has fundamentally misunderstood Ratzinger's position. First, Ratzinger explicitly in his uh, Strasbourg uh, lecture affirms that the, quote, the specific claim of the Catholic Church is not abandoned, unquote, with the change from subsisted in. 
What Ratzinger was rejecting was the total identification of the Church of Christ with the Catholic Church in such a way that there is no ecclesiality outside of her, i.e. position one. He notes that there are two elements in the tradition that must be accounted for. One, the tradition repeatedly acknowledges the existence of non-Catholic local churches outside of the one church. And two, the Catholic Church recognizes that there are valid baptisms outside of the church. Both points demonstrate that there's a real ecclesiality outside of her. This is what Ratzinger meant when he said that subsisted in is more spacious than est. Ratzinger again considers the relationship between the local church and the universal church as an ecumenically fruitful way of thinking about how communion could be realized. He argues that the Catholic Church is the true church, and its tendencies in recent centuries was to collapse the universal church into the local church of Rome. He repeats again the concern that Catholics have to be willing to accept a plurality of churches. Ratzinger again returned to the issue of subsisted in in the wake of the controversy surrounding Hans Kuhn. In 1967, Herder published Kuhn's work, The Church, in which he attempted to describe not what the church is, but rather what he thinks it should be in light of the gospel. Kuhn's view on the nature of the church was that there is a plurality of churches that constitutes the one church of Christ. Kuhn's notion of the plurality of churches was in essence the same as Schlink's, i.e. position three. As evidence of his position, Kuhn argued that the council's change from est to subsisted in entailed that the Catholic Church does not identify herself exclusively, in spite of some formulas which seem to suggest otherwise, with the Church of Christ. Kuhn understood the phrase subsisted in to mean to exist in, as indeed he translated it. Kuhn suggested that the council's formulation, uh, per, uh, quote, purposely was purposely left as vague as possible, unquote. He went on to note that one should not place in the definition of the church such things as the primacy of the pope, because to do so is to limit the church. Both the German Bishops' Conference and the CDF entered dialogue with Kuhn over these matters, but he remained recalcitrant. In 1973, after four years of conversation with Kuhn, the CDF issued his declaration in defense of the Catholic doctrine on the church against certain errors of the present day, better known by its incipit Mysterium Ecclesiae. Predictably, the CDF's document was not well received in some quarters. The Lutheran uh, bishop Hans Heinrich uh, Harms, for example, objected that with Mysterium Ecclesiae, the Catholic church was on its way to becoming a mega sect. In response, in 1974, Ratzinger wrote a short article defending Mysterium Ecclesiae. According to Ratzinger, part of the problem was that both within and without the church itself, there was a general ignorance of the actual text of Lumen Gentium. Part of the consequence of this fact is that the equation of the Church of Christ with the Catholic Church is no longer generally held by Catholics. Ratzinger argues that Lumen Gentium 8's intention was to affirm this exclusive identity. He states that no translation of subsisted in, quote, can fully capture the supply, sublime nuance of the Latin text, unquote, which preserve two essential ecclesiological truths. First, quote, the unconditional equation of the Church of Christ with the Roman Catholic Church, unquote, and two, churches separated from her are not non-church simpliciter. What is striking is that Ratzinger explicitly states that the unconditional equation of the first draft of Lumen Gentium with the est clause was preserved with the shift from est to subsisted in. He employs the language of both full identity and of Catholic identity to describe the relationship of the Church of Christ with the Catholic Church. For Ratzinger, this change was a reaffirmation of position two. Ratzinger asks how it came to pass that Lumen Gentium 8 subsisted in, which was considered an ecumenical breakthrough in 1963, is in so short of a, short, so short of a time considered anti-ecumenical. 
with a church on its way to being considered a megasect. Ratzinger holds that Mysterium Ecclesiae excluded two of the six possible uh, five possible positions uh, one could draw from subsisted in. First, he argues that it rejected the view that the Church of Christ is made up of a collection of various dominant denominations, i.e. position three. Second, he thinks that the document excludes uh, the notion of the Church of Christ exists concrete and in its full, fullness nowhere today, i.e. position five. Ratzinger twice uses the word concrete to explain the existence of the Church of Christ in the Catholic Church. In one instance, he uses the term full as a modifier of concreteness to point out that the Catholic Church is not a partial realization of the Church of Christ. This terminology is striking as it was not materially present in Mysterium Ecclesiae. Conclusion. There are several conclusions that one can draw from Ratzinger the theologian's writings prior to his appointment of the CDF. First, Ratzinger the theologian was remarkably consistent in affirming exclusive identity, i.e. position two. He also explicitly rejects positions one, three, and five repeatedly. The, repudia the repudiation of position four is, of course, implied in his affirmation of position two. Second, the young Ratzinger cannot be said to contradict Ratzinger, the prefect of the CDF. Sullivan mistakenly misunderstood Ratzinger's rejection of position one for, for a rejection of position two. Third, one should note that Ratzinger is not interpreting subsistence as meaning to exist, like Kuhn, nor is he interpreting it simply to mean to be. He clearly is using it in a technical theological sense to mean to exist in a concrete and integral way, hence his emphasis on the concreteness and fullness. I would now like to dwell on some of the implications of Ratzinger's interpretation of subsisted in for contemporary ecumenical dialogue. First, one must recognize that there's a fundamental asymmetry in the claims of the Catholic Church and the claims of Protestant ecclesial communities concerning the respective status as church. For Luther, the Catholic Church was neither a church nor the church. Likewise, Johann Gerhardt, the famous Lutheran scholastic, taught that, quote, the Lutheran church is a true, pure, and orthodox church, and, quote, the Roman church is not a true church, let alone the true church. Like Luther, Calvin categorically denied to the Catholic Church the title church. Both Lutheran and Reformed theologians, however, were willing to admit that the element, that elementa, to use the council's term, remained in the Catholic Church. Calvin preferred uh, the term vestigia. After 50 years of ecumenical dialogue, Protestants have come to acknowledge that the Catholic Church is indeed a true church. Such a concession on their part, however, does not entail any modification of a Protestant community's own self-understanding of what it means to be church, since they have always acknowledged that other communities could be, quote, a true, pure, and orthodox church, as long as they had preserved, quote, pure preaching of the word and the legitimate administration of the sacraments. The Catholic Church, on the other hand, claims to be as Ratzinger has noted, the one sole subsistence of the Church of Christ. This is an exclusive identity in such a way that Protestant communities are simply not part of the Church of Christ, and that's Protestant communities as such, not individual Protestants. If the Church were to recognize that Protestant ecclesial communities as such are part of the Church of Christ, or to say that the Catholic Church is merely a true church, then Ratzinger is correct in his, in his reply to Schlink that the Catholic Church would have fundamentally altered her own self-understanding, i.e. she would no longer recognize that she is the exclusive concrete and integral expression of the Church of Christ. Some contemporary ecumenists argue that besides being wrong, Ratzinger's position on exclusive identity makes ecumenism nearly impossible. The question is, is this true? Dropping the claim of exclusive identity entailed by Ratzinger's interpretation uh, 
would in a certain sense make ecumenism easier with the ecclesial communities emerging from the Reformation. But only by making the Catholic Church into a Protestant communion. As Ratzinger's response to Schlink makes clear. On the other hand, it would make dialogue with the Orthodox easier since they hold a view similar to the Catholic Church. This, was recent, uh, this view was recently reasserted at the Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church held in 2016. The Council was clear that the Orthodox Church is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The Catholic Church, on, the Catholic church and the Orthodox churches, in fact, hold the same doctrine that the Church of Christ has a sole concrete expression, i.e., both communions reject positions three through five. The difference between the Orthodox and the Catholics is about whether about which concrete expression of church is the one church of Christ. So entering into full communion with the Orthodox would not be a fundamental doctrinal change. So to the answer. So the answer is, of course, both yes and no with respect to different non-Catholic churches and ecclesial communities. Ratzinger's interpretation of Svistin beautifully holds together two doctrines that pull in different directions. Thank you. We have about 20 minutes for questions. So if uh, Dr. Root and Dr. Washburn would sit at the table uh, up front. And we have a microphone here to my right for a cue. While we're waiting for the cue to form, perhaps I could ask the first one just to kill some time. Um, uh, I suppose this is mostly f for you, Christian, but both of you could speak to it. I found your taxonomy of the positions, the five positions, very helpful. And I'm wondering, in practice, did the church fail somehow to live number two? Um, that is to say, did she act as if number one were the case? Did she, before the council, say underestimate the elements of sanctification? I'm thinking of, uh, as an example, I don't know how widely practiced it was but say the, the practice of rebaptizing, uh, say a Lutheran or, or a Protestant who would enter full communion. Uh, yes, I, I think this is a difficult question about how she acted, because of course you'd have to uh, look at this uh, in different times and in different places. But for example, in the 19th century, it was customary to rebaptize uh, most Protestants. Uh, now the reason for this, uh, isn't because we thought their uh, baptisms were invalid because mm. of improper, uh, because of their liturgical texts contained improper matter and form, but rather because oftentimes at the practical level, uh, they were not uh, using proper matter and form, even if their liturgical texts required it. Um, but I think Ratzinger's answer to this question is yes, we did fail to live it in a certain way. And the, and, particularly uh, this uh, view that um, the Church of Rome ought to become the model for every other local church. I mean, for example, in the 16th century, St. Charles Borromeo had this very problem. You had had the uh, uh, St. Pius V issue the Missale Romanum in 1570, and Quo Primum had certain requirements about uh, uh, the adoption of the Missale Romanum. But there was a fair amount of pressure put on Borromeo to adopt uh, the uh, Missale Romanum. But of course, in Milan, uh, the local church had a custom of the Ambrosian Rite, right? And uh, St. Charles Borromeo uh, actually put up a fair amount of resistance to the Roman pressure um, by republishing, uh, him, uh, having republished uh, the various uh, liturgical books for the Ambrosian Rite, uh, even going so far as to pick the font for them. Um, but I think this is an important point because what you see is this tendency of uh, uh, a type of Roman cent centralization to impose itself on other local churches which have their own customs. Mm -hmm. What I think Ratzinger was calling for is if you look at the New Testament, you see different local churches, for example, in Corinth and uh, Jerusalem, uh, and they have their own kind of unique uh, 
uh, characteristics. Uh, and so I think Ratzinger would fault this tendency towards in the order of act, right? Not yeah. in the order of being. Sure. Uh, but would tend to fault uh, these tendencies uh, in the, uh, particularly the 16th through 19th century. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Okay, Dr. Shrek. My name's uh, Alan Schreck. I've taught here for 45 years. I've taught ecclesiology and Vatican II, and uh, I'm totally on board with uh, Joseph Ratzinger, now Pope Emeritus Benedict's read on subsisted in, and so, and I teach this in my classes. My question is more, maybe for you and for anyone else, is more of a pastoral question. And um, for example, for a number of years, I was an advisor of a campus organization, Udunum Synth, uh, a, a student organization desiring to promote Christian unity. And um, for a number of years, it was a very vibrant society. We would, would have an exchange with Wheaton College, a noted American evangelical college, where we'd have mutual visits. Uh, um, and it just seems like in the past, maybe five or six years, um, well, that society no longer exists because it seems like there's no longer a passion or an understanding among students of the necessity to work for Christian unity. It seems like, and what Dr. Root said at the end, you know, maybe we have to suffer this, but it seems like we're in a period, at least in my observation, of almost ecumenical stagnation in terms of with the, uh, particularly with the Protestant churches. Like when I teach ecclesiology, I, I have our students make a church visit to a church other than their own, which is mainly not a Catholic church, just to have an experience that other Christians really have. Obviously, you know, we can't receive communion and all the proper uh, uh, disciplines we respect, but, but to have the students have at least an experience and exposure of how other Christians think. But my, my observation to end my question is, what I've seen is students, largely because of Pope Benedict's emphasis on the extraordinary form, is we have students really excited about extraordinary form liturgies, and we also have a certain interest in other uh, Eastern Rite Catholic liturgies, Maronite Rite and Byzantine. And I think those are all good things. I'm not criticizing this, but it seems, my observation is it's totally taken the steam out of a passion that Jesus had in John 17, 21, Father that may all be one. It, I don't know how to stir up students' enthusiasm for the passion that Christ had for the restoration of unity. You know, given you know, sound theology, it seems like students just don't seem to be interested on our campus in really the quest for Christian unity. And I've tried to stir that up and stand for that, but. I'm really sort of at a loss. Now I'm retiring, so I hope someone carries on this. But how do we, how do based on, you know, the emphases of the recent, you know, of 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 our doctrine, how can we stir up the passion to say? Because I think students think this is not never going to happen. It's sort of the ecumenical stagnation I see setting in. Our passion has to be reserved, reverse that. It seems to me. How do we do that? And is it the fault of our theology that even though we're presenting it correctly, that, that somehow there's a lack of an understanding of the necessity of Christian unity as something that students and us, we have to really invest in until we somehow make progress or achieve that. Let me make three comments. Do I need to turn something on here? Is it on? No, you're good. What? We can it's hear on. you. Good. First, I do think particularly perhaps in the last decade, the tendency of a consumer market mentality to penetrate, particularly among younger people, their understanding of ecclesial difference is now pretty deep. And I think this has increased under COVID when many church contacts became online. The tendency to view um, Coke versus Pepsi, Skippy versus Jif, for those of you who are not Americans, um, I love peanut butter. Um, and I'm deeply devoted, completely, to Skippy Extra Crunchy. Um, Skippy Super, <laughs> Skippy Super Crunch, but but no, my enthusiasm for Skippy Super Crunch, um, the food of the gods, <laughs> is not church dividing. It doesn't get it doesn't get me any real difference with other people. I mean, I like Skippy Super Crunch. You may like Jif. I like Coke. You may like Pepsi. Um, it's just and it's good to have all these different things on the market. 
Uh, that tends to be, I think, more, more deeply the attitude of people toward church difference. You know, you like smells and bells? Fine, be a high church Anglican. You know, you're a kind of crypto authoritarian, be a Catholic. Um, well, I'm serious, I'm serious, I'm dead serious. I mean, I think the sort of penetration of, an, of, a, of, a, of a consumer market mentality into understanding, particularly perhaps among the younger generation, with the, the, the complete uh, digitalization and onlineization of life. Now, this is an old guy. You know, I'm, I'm now a garrulous old man. Um, I think that's a big, big issue. Second, I think there is a real problem that's gone on within Protestant communities. Uh, I mean, the, ma the massive fall off in numbers, among, I think among evangelicals, uh, what one called evangelicals. I think the, the, the impact of the Trump years has been deeply disruptive. They don't, many evangelicals aren't sure they want to call themselves evangelicals anymore. Others have, have become quite politicized. I think that's the set of issues. That's my second kind of comment. And I do think third, um, let me see how I can phrase this in a way that doesn't get my canonical mission revoked. Um, <laughs> I do think there are issues within Catholicism where perhaps, under, as under John Paul II and under Pope Benedict, there was a certain confidence about what was the orthodox core of the Catholic faith, and that was pretty, pretty well nailed down. I think perhaps among many people I know, that's less certain these days. And so there is much more of an internal, an internal you know, we need, to be, we need to pay attention to just what the Catholic Church stands for, uh, because it may be more at risk when I have that kind of feeling. Uh, one needs to, to guard things. And I think that has had a certain kind of impression uh, among uh, Catholics. So we go back to my second point with the crisis, I think, among Protestants. I just find a lot of what goes on, I mean, I'm a theologian. I mean, a lot of Protestant theology is just boring. I mean, if you look at the young Rothsinger, I mean, he was introduced by Zerngen to read Karl Barth. Karl Barth's many things, but he's not boring. I mean, there's, you know, there's intellectual fireworks going on. So I think there's a lot, of, a lot of things going in here, and I think a certain kind of patience and sticking to it is what's called for. Thank you. In dark times. Dr. Casarelli? Can I? Oh, can very I quickly, ask? please, Christian, yeah. So um, I, I guess, the, can everyone hear me? Yep. I, I guess what I'd like to add to that is, you know, frankly, Catholic, uh, Catholic and uh, non-Catholic ecumenists in general haven't done themselves any favors. So I'll give an example uh, by their activity. Um, as Dr. Root pointed out, what ecumenical dialogue ought to be is a dialogue in the truth, right? And it's sometimes been the case uh, uh, that uh, this has not prevailed in ecumenical dialogue. And so there's a, I think amongst young people, there's a fair amount of skepticism with respect to dialogue. So for example, I was teaching, going to teach a graduate course on ecumenism, and a, uh, I won't say where, uh, but um, a student came up to me and he said, oh, I'm so happy to take your course on ecumenism. And I asked this uh, person why, and he said, well, because you're going to try and destroy it. And I thought, well, why would you think that? And he responded, well, you're a Thomist. And I said, well, my Thomism makes me accept ecumenical councils, and we had this little thing called the Second Vatican Council, <laughs> and it had a decree on ecumenism, and one ought to be obedient to this decree. But my point is, his skepticism, I think, was precisely because, uh, I, I, Michael can speak to this as, as well as I can, I mean, I was on a dialogue one time, and a Catholic was attempting to defend that there were 14 sacraments. You can see why the young who are enthusiastic about the faith may raise questions about this. And I kind of put that on our community so that we have bred a certain amount of skepticism. Thank you. Dr. Kessler? Uh Peter Kessler, Duke Divinity, two brilliant presentations. Thank you both. Question for Dr. Washburn of a philological nature, an old question, but when Rotzinger says that subsistence in is more spacious and has sublime nuance in comparison to S, and I know there's a recent Gregorian dissertation on this question as well, but um, I take, I agree with that, and I take it as a hermeneutical point. Um, but there's, I think, a philological argument that they're identical, and I, and I'm just wondering if there's evidence in the documents of the council when that was adopted, with regard to the philological point, or in Rotzinger, because we normally expect from Rotzinger a philological explanation and not just a hermeneutical or a theological one. So could you speak to this this question, please? 
Yeah, so this is kind of perplexed, I, I think, discussion, uh, the philological question is perplexed discussion about subsisted in. And basically, everyone is all over the map on it. And what's striking about it is whether you view it as to be or to continue to exist, or you view it as a philosophical technical term or a theological technical term. I have an article on this that came out in the Josephinum where I go through, in part, the philological uh, questions. The philological question does not resolve where you stand on the issue. So this is what's a little strange about it. So uh, you can have people viewing it as a simply as a version of est, right? Uh, but that leads people to very radically different positions. Um, in my view, I think that you ought to uh, use it in a technical theological sense, meaning to exist in a concrete and integral way. And the latter Ratzinger, so here he, he doesn't do that, but the latter Ratzinger does. Um, and I think this is correct. And the argument for this is if you look, so there are two ways to look at this, how the term is used ordinarily, this is Sullivan's argument, and Sullivan will say, for example, you ought to always use a term or in its ordinary sense rather than its technical sense unless there's a special reason for doing it. But my ar counter argument is, well, uh, yes, I agree with this unless you're in a technical discipline, in which case you would expect the ordinary sense to be the technical sense, right? And so if you look at, for example, how this uh, verb is used on the eve of the council, you see that uh, Venerable Pius XII uses it repeatedly in a Christological sense, right? And so I would suggest uh, this is the, the likely outcome. Moreover, you get this impression from Trump's explanation, right? So if we're assuming that that is the origin of, of the text and not Schmidt, uh, his explanation only conforms with a technical theological definition. And so I think you have to look at the context to understand what's going on. And again, I go on in my article uh, about this. Father Michael. Tremendously enjoyed both uh, presentations. Just one uh, observation on a comment uh, Dr. Wash Washman made uh, in, uh, just in the question session about that liturgical uniformity in the 16th century. To a large extent, that was really driven by the bishops at the Council of Trent. There was a real push from uh, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish bishops to have a uniform missal and breviary throughout the church. I suppose as a response to the liturgical and sacramental confusion that was uh, caused by the cataclysmic events of the, um, of the Reformation. And um, of course, St. Pius V uh, made uh, provisions for rites that were older than 200 years to, to be continued. So maybe uh, St. Charles Borromeo felt that pressure because he was closer to Rome. But uh, it just the, the bishops actually pushed for, for uh, kind of uniform liturgical books uh, at that period. And the great English um, liturgist uh, Adrian Fortescue sort of regretted that, but thought it was uh, understandable response to the uh, situation. But I want a question for, for Dr. Root regarding uh, justification of the joint declaration. I mean, it's really uh, quite, quite striking how uh, Joseph Ratzinger sort of, um, can sort of relativize the importance of simul justus et peccato yeah. and just focus on the ecclesiological implications. I mean, th these are still very fundamental questions about um, the collaboration of human agency in right. Uh, the process of salvation with divine agency. And um, uh, I was wondering, would you see, to, to what extent do you think is the document really success successful? It seems to me the document uh, uh, takes the sort of dual justification approach of the Regensburg colloquy, sort of both imparted and, and imputed, and, and puts them side by side. I mean, uh, but there are questions that seem to be uh, unresolved like that of Merit, and that's really, in a sense, the crunching point. How do you, how do you understand, uh, really, set the question of merit in the process of justification? And uh, just, uh, I don't want to go on too long, but Joseph Ratzinger also very interestingly uh, said, as you mentioned, uh, uh, well, uh, how important the question Luther asked is for us today, because it's often uh, not, not not understood at all. So, I mean, um, uh, the question is is uh, is of tremendous importance, but. Can we reconcile his answer with the Catholic position? I do think the JDDJ is successful. I would say, as a Catholic, I think it accomplishes less than I thought it than it accomplished as a Lutheran. That is, I think the accomplishment of the JDJ is more limited. 
I think one has to understand that for a Lutheran, if you, grace tends to be understood as a subtopic under the heading justification. And for a Catholic, justification is a subtopic under grace. And so grace takes in a good deal more for a Catholic than, than it would theologically for a Lutheran. And thus for a Lutheran, when you settle justification, you really settle a whole bunch of things in their heads. I certainly thought so. Um, and for a Catholic, you haven't. Now on the symbol, it's important to note a couple of things. If you go looking at Lutheran theology between about 1540 and 1910, you can't find anybody discussing the symbol. There's an article by Wolf Dieter Hauschild in um, the Ökumenische Arbeitskreis volume on um, on, uh, on the sim on the on the Civil Justice of Peccator, uh, done about 2005 or six, where they sent Wolf Dieter Hauschild, a, a historian of modern Protestant theology, away to write about Lutheran theologians discussing the symbol in the 19th century, and he came back and said they didn't. They simply didn't. I mean, this really is a creation that the symbol uses of Picotter is a central assertion of, of Lutheranism is an invention of the Luther Renaissance, of, the, of the, the sort of 1910s, 1920s, 1930s. Now, Lutherans consistently affirmed that concupiscence is itself sin in the strict sense, and so in a certain sense, the symbol was already always there. But it wasn't a particularly central notion. That's point number one. Point number two, I do think that some questions about merit are perhaps not fully tied down in the joint declaration. Um, that requires, I think, a good deal of work. That would be the place where um, I might have a book on it in 10 years if I live that long. Uh, I mean, I, that's what I'm trying to work on right now, some issues involved there. I, I do think the joint declaration settles the issue so that it is not in and of itself, that I think is what's decisive, in and of itself, it is not decisive. I mean, they're not church dividing. However, there may be closely related implications or foundations, which are, and I would, I took a paragraph out of my paper uh, that I wrote, but it's, uh, that I do think foundational for the Catholic Luther indifference on these ellipses I noted is precisely the role of the human response. For example, that in a, doctrine, a Catholic understanding of grace, the human response is a genuine agency in Christ, and in Christ it can be meritorious. Uh, so there, there is a kind of, I've gone on too long and I haven't been clear, but to say I do think the joint declaration accomplishes what it says, which is quite limited. That is, these issues in and of themselves, should you solve everything else, are not church divisive. Uh, I would note also second, um, what the Catholic Church says is that, the, is that the Lutheran position outlined in that text does not come under Catholic condemnations. There are plenty of Lutherans who don't like the Lutheran position as described there, and their position might be condemned by Catholic teaching. So it's, a, it's more complicated and limited than one might think. One has to read exactly what the text says. Uh, I can say for my own, since I was on the drafting committee, um, those limitations were very clear to us. Thank you. So we'll take two more questions, the two remaining, on the condition that both the questioner and the respondents agreed sure. to be brief. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, Father James Bradley, uh, you spoke, Dr. Root, about those three um, ways in which Joseph Ratzinger approaches ecumenism with the Orthodox, with Protestants, and with Anglicans. I note that only one of those three has brought about a realization of some degree of communion between those who still identify in some way as Anglicans and have come into the Catholic Church through the ordinariates. And I wonder whether or not uh, that particular uh, view of ecumenism and, and, and approach to ecumenism that you drew out in Ratzinger's writings, identifying where he finds commonality with small groups might be a shift away from what we might describe as inter-ecclesial ecum ecumenical dialogue to discussion with specific groups within ecclesial communities outside the Catholic Church. And I take it you mean something like that Anglican Orm Chedibusen that led to the Anglican Ordinariate? Unsurprisingly, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to be, to be very quick, uh, yes. I mean, I do think, as, as, as Professor Washburn laid out, I mean, there is a kind of path forward 
perhaps, where you could reconcile an entire Protestant church. But a problem is, because of the nature of the internal authorities within the Protestant bodies, it's not exactly here how they could commit themselves. The Anglican, Anglican communion cannot commit itself, lock, stock, and barrel. And if the Church of England, let's say, were to sort of reach it with Rome, how much of the Church of England would come along? Um, so I think the kind of initiative that's, that's in the Anglican ordinariate is, I think, precisely the sort of thing that needs to be done. Okay, quick. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, did, <laughs> I didn't mean necessarily that quick, but I appreciate that. Thank, thank you. Father, Father Samir. Thank you. Um, just a comment, and I would like to hear your thoughts. I spoke yesterday about the interreligious dialogue, and I really think that Ratzinger takes his principles and models for interreligious relations from the ecumenical realm, and is really an application. I think that is based on Lumen Gentium. Lumen Gentium 8 talks about subsisted, and then in 15, the Pertinere group, so the application to the non-Christian communities. But I think what's often forgotten is that Lumen Gentium 16, immediately after 15, then extends this and talks about those ordered to the ordinary, and so we're talking about the non-Christian uh, groups. So I'd just like to hear your comments on, um, I think there's very little of that actually um, in the literature, and sort of the relation between both the ecumenical and the inter-religious and the hierarchical then participation in the fullness of the church. So really reading Lumen Gentium 16 and 15 in light of Lumen Gentium 8. And, uh, and I think Ratzinger implicitly, not explicitly because he doesn't comment on this, his theology provides that road work or that framework forward. So just your comments. That's very interesting. It'd be something I have to think about a good deal more. Um, I do think that ecumenically, a, something I did not mention at all, which is quite important and forms kind of a, a movement from between ecumenical and irreligious is the status of the Jews in Israel. Um, I mean, in a sense, they're part of the people of God, but in another sense, they're a different religion, so to speak. I mean, that's just where, where Judaism, I mean, is in Nostra Aetate, uh, not in not in Unitatis or in De Grazio, um, but they're not exactly. I mean, they worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so do we. I mean, so that's a complicated case with Judaism, whether it's precisely an odd kind of ecumenism or a particularly close kind of interreligious. Um, but I do think it's very interesting. I just haven't thought about it, to tell you the truth. I don't think it comes up much in Ratzinger. I didn't, I didn't see it. Perhaps, you, I mean, you may very well have, uh, but I didn't, so I can't. That'd be an interesting thing to explore, uh, is all I can say. Please join me in thanking our panelists.